TCC, welcome to our online service. My name is Jake and this is Ty. Hey, and we are so glad that you chose to join us here today for church. We are in our second week of our new series, Beauty for Ashes, and this series will take us all the way through to Easter Sunday. And speaking of Easter, I'm so excited about this because we are going to take advantage of our beautiful lawn, also known as the Shady Oak Campus. That's Pretty right. Sweet. It is super sweet. And we're gonna come together with all of TCC for an outdoor service on Easter Sunday. That's right, it's gonna be awesome. So awesome, so cannot cool. wait. We're also gonna hold our Good Friday service at the Shady Oak Campus on April 2nd. We will have more details on that in the next few weeks, so stay tuned, you don't wanna miss that. And for now, just mark your calendars and tell your friends to join us on April 2nd for Good Friday and April 4th for Easter. And if you're not comfortable attending outdoor gatherings, no problem, we'll be bringing you an Easter service right here online as well. One more thing before we throw it back to the band, if this is your first time tuning into TCC today, I want to extend our warmest welcome to you and say thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, prayer requests, or would like to know more about TCC, please feel free to contact the office at any time and we'd love to speak with you. Well, it's impossible to look outside these days and not feel overwhelmed with gratitude, respect, and quite frankly, just awe at God's creation. And I can think of no better response to that feeling than to pour out our hearts in worship for all that he has done for us through creation, through the cross, and through the salvation freely offered to each one of us, we give him all the glory and praise. And I invite you to join us now as we sing together. Take it away, worship team. i 
there. Uh, for those of you who might be new, my name is Shane. I'm one of the pastors here at TCC. I'm the pastor of preaching and media. Thanks for joining us today. Beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. That, that's a phrase I'm sure you've heard before. It's an evocative phrase and a fitting one for a Linton sermon series, which we are in. Last week, Ty kicked us off and did a wonderful job of laying out the history of Lent, the reason for it, the good things about it, the criticisms of it, and how we can rightly engage with this liturgy. So if you missed that, and if you're curious about Lent, uh, go back and listen to that sermon. But regardless of whether or not you're actually fasting during this time, or doing penance, or giving alms, the common sorts of things that are associated with Lent, this is a valuable season for us as we approach Easter. As we approach Holy Week, as we draw nearer to Calvary, we are focusing, centering, grounding ourselves on our need for the cross, for the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus of Nazareth. So we do things like fast and deprive ourselves so that the celebration of Easter is punctuated, is accentuated. We fast to remind ourselves of our need for the bread of life, for our need for the water of life. But I think we can take this and, and just sort of twist it into a, an opportunity for self-improvement. You know, I've been meaning to lose a few pounds anyway, so I'm giving up carbs for Lent. No, Lent is not a diet plan. Lent is not a New Year's resolution. It's not a self-help program. Oh, there's, there's plenty of room for self-improvement and plenty of need for spiritual and, yes, even physical betterment. But this season of reflection is really not on what we can do but on what God has done. It is to point us and to remind us of our desperate need for Jesus. Jesus is heading for the cross. And if we're going to make any sense of that, we have to understand our desperate need for it. So open up your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 1. Along with fasting and self-denial, Lent is also traditionally a time of repentance. And Jesus, in this passage, is going to teach us that we have a need for repentance. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So there's a bit of a hubbub going on. We don't know what happened at this particular incident with the Galileans, but this is in keeping with what we do know of Pilate, who, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, faced many protests from the Jews, which sometimes resulted in bloody oppression. But what captures Jesus' attention is that there seems to be a theological error at play. They are looking at life circumstances and attributing all misfortune to personal sin and wickedness. Those Galileans suffered because they were unrighteous. The tower fell on these people and not these people because those people clearly were unrighteous and these people must have been more righteous. And that line of thinking is not without reason. That's not completely off the wall. They must have read Deuteronomy. Here's the word of the Lord. It says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hands to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. 
The Lord will establish you as his holy people as he promised you on oath if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. And then in verse 15, we get to the curses. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed and the crops of your lamb and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done in forsaking him. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew, which will plague you until you perish. The sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath you iron. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will come down from the skies until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven, and you will become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms on earth. Your carcasses will be food for all the birds and the wild animals, and there will be no one to frighten them away. That seems pretty straightforward. Blessings and curses. If you obey the law, if you do the right things, you'll be blessed. Wealth, food, prosperity, peace, a good life. But if you disobey the law, if you live an unrighteous life, you'll be cursed. Hunger, poverty, your enemies will triumph over you. Pilate will humiliate you. You'll be destroyed and come to a sudden ruin like a tower falling on you out of the blue. Makes sense. And in general, living righteously does have tangible, practical benefits for the here and now. And unrighteous living often does lead ultimately to destruction and brokenness and a mess, even in this life. But here's the thing. What did it say? It said, if, this is conditional, here's the condition, if you fully obey the Lord your God. Oh no. That's a problem because none of us have done that. We don't actually fall under the category of blessings. We fall under the category of curses. Both Jews and Gentiles fall under that, as Paul makes clear in Romans. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And Paul explains this further in chapter 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. God gives us the law so that we recognize that we don't live up to it, that we do not fully obey it. And as it says in James, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. We have not fully obeyed, which means we've broken all of it. 
We're not under the first category of blessings. We're under the category of curses. And that's what Jesus is arguing here in Luke. People were thinking, oh, the tower didn't fall on me. I must be in the good column. And Jesus says, no, you're all guilty and you need repentance. Do you think that you're more righteous than others? Do you stack up pretty well? You know, you look around. I stack up pretty well, you know. And I'm doing pretty well for myself, too. And that's that's because, unlike others, I made the right kind of choices. You know, I didn't mess up my life. I didn't get involved in gangs. I didn't commit crimes. I didn't do drugs. I waited till marriage to have children, right? Lived righteously. That's why a tower didn't fall on me like it did other people. Of course, their lives are messed up. What would you expect? Look what they did. Look at the choices they made. I mean, they really need repentance. I mean, yes, we, we, we all need repentance. We all need forgiveness. We all need Jesus. I just don't need him as much. Is that how we view ourselves? See, just like the people in Luke, um, we can place ourselves in the wrong category because of life circumstances and congratulate ourselves on our own righteousness and lose sight of our desperate need for repentance and forgiveness. You think you're more righteous? You look good compared to others? How about Job? How do you stack up against Job? Here's how God describes Job. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That's how God describes Job. Blameless upright, no one like him. But then uh, God permits Satan to torment Job. He loses all of his wealth, all of his children are killed, and he loses his health. And Job is naturally perplexed by this, going, I, I don't understand, I didn't do anything. And his friends are kind of going, well, you know, it kind of looks like a tower fell on you, so... But you know how it ends for Job? This blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. You know how it ends for him? In repentance. In repentance. Job 42, verses 5 through 6. These are the last words of Job when he meets God. He says this, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Dust and ashes. Well, make no mistake about it. That is how we all come to meet Jesus. In repentance, in dust and ashes. I despise myself. That's what he says. I despise myself. I don't like that. Do you like that? I don't like that. See, that's, that's not affirming. You know, let's get some affirmation in here, right? You are amazing. You are beautiful. You are wonderful. You are perfect just the way you are. And don't let anyone tell you different. Well, that feels better, doesn't it? That feels more loving. In, in Paradise Lost, which is a poem on the fall of man and, and of Satan as well. In Milton's poem, Satan rebels against God and is cast down out of heaven. And then Satan says this, Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world, and through profoundest hell receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. 
See, ultimately, a rebellion against God is a rebellion against reality. Satan is claiming here that he is sovereign and free in his mind. And so by his mind, by the power of his mind, he can transform reality itself. With his mind, he can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Or to use another piece of classic literature, uh, in the book The Witch, the Gargoyle, and the Perfectly Perfect Man, the Perfectly Perfect Man is not really perfect, he's actually the villain, and in the story he gives this monologue on how he became perfect. He says this, You want to know how I became perfect? I spoke it into being. I said I was perfect, and I said it loud enough and long enough until I realized that I had always been perfect. People are always getting it backwards. They think that self-improvement is the means to perfection, but obviously that's a contradiction in terms. If you need self-improvement, then you are admitting that there is something in yourself that needs improvement. And ipso facto, if there is something in you that needs improvement, then you are far from perfect. Therefore, the only way to be perfect is to admit that you already are perfect and that you need no improvement. The real trick is to squash any negativity. The world may call you ugly. The world may call you fat. The world will say all matter of horrible things about you, but don't believe their lies and embrace your perfection. Unsurprisingly, that kind of thinking leads to his demise, and it will lead to ours as well. You know, that may seem incredibly silly, but it really is the thinking of our world. We are a world. We are a people that calls good evil and evil good. It says boys can be girls and girls can be boys, that we can transform reality itself by the power of our minds. We can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. And we think that liberating ourselves from God will elevate us. See, if I admit God's existence, then I'm subject to him, and that diminishes me. If I admit that I need a savior, then I'm not sufficient and that diminishes me. If I admit that I need repentance and forgiveness, then I'm in the wrong, and that diminishes me. Oh, better just to reject all of that, and then I won't be diminished, and I won't be shamed. I can make hell into heaven, and heaven into hell. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Reality asserts itself in the end. Our ears have heard of God, but one day our eyes will see him. We think that liberating ourselves from God will elevate us, but it does nothing of the sort. You know, later on in Paradise Lost, Satan says this, Me miserable, which way shall I fly? Infinite wrath and infinite despair. Which way I fly is hell, myself am hell. Satan wanted to elevate himself, and all he did was fall lower and lower. Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Unless you repent, you too will perish. See, repentance requires, repentance demands that we admit who we are. At the start of Lent on Ash Wednesday, we repeat the words that God, our Father and Maker and Sovereign said at the fall of mankind. For dust we are, and to dust we shall return. We admit our mortality. We admit our weakness. We admit our frailty. We admit the consequences of our sin for which we have no answer. We are desperate. Listen to these words from Lamentations. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence. 
for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. I actually like the NASB translation better. I think it's more accurate, too. It's why I put it in the bumper video. Let him put his mouth in the dust. It's like you can taste it, right? That kind of humility, that kind of desperation. Oh, don't make it theoretical. Don't make it symbolic. No, our sin puts us in that position where all that we can do is put our face in the dust. Because we got nothing but ashes. And yet, what does Jeremiah say in Lamentations? Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. There may yet be hope because of the Lord's great love and his faithfulness and his compassion. You know, Je Jeremiah never saw Jesus of Nazareth, but his hope was in him. What he's crying out for, what he's desperate for, is Jesus of Nazareth. And that is our cry too, and our need as the Apostle Paul proclaimed in Romans 7. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God takes on flesh. He comes down into the dust with us and he raises up to new life and restores us because of his love and his kindness and his compassion. He gives us beauty for ashes. When God first made man, it says this in Genesis, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. And God said that it was good, but we wanted to elevate ourselves to be like God and so we sinned and fell back into dust. But Jesus comes to us. He takes on our sin and he dies in our place, but his body did not see decay. It doesn't turn to dust. No, he rises from the dead and he meets his disciples and he says this. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit shows up dramatically in Acts. It says this, suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. We remember that we are dust and to dust we shall return. But thanks be to God who does not leave us in the dust. But because of his great love and compassion, we have hope if we claim our desperate need for Jesus. And because he is faithful, he breathes on us his Holy Spirit once more and brings life back into dust. Let's praise him. Rumors of the Son of Man
Jesus invites us to come to him. He is willing to take our sin, to take our failings, to take our ashes, but we must come to him on his terms. We need to recognize that we need him, recognize that we need forgiveness. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness.